Hello dreamers, welcome to a new episode of Reflections with an Accent. My name is Kike Calvo, photographer and entrepreneur. Today we have a very special guest. She has been a photographer, she has been a photo editor, and she was the first female director of photography at National Geographic magazine. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Sarah Lin. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Kike. How are you? I'm doing okay. It's it's a pleasure to to have you in this uh, in this program. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Absolutely. Very nice to see you. So we'll we'll start with a very simple questions question. The first question that I have for you, Sarah, is why? And you can answer in any way you want. <laughs> oh, that's a very why I think of, for me, it's uh, like, why photography? Why has photography been my whole life? Uh, and I would, my answer to that would be, um, I love to see things. I love to see the world. I love to see people. I love to see images. I think that I, I experienced so much of, of my life th through my eyes. And I have, I think, ever since a child. I loved art. And um, I think that for me, it's uh, that that seeing and capturing and holding on to the world and to people and to memories um, has just been something that's sustained me through my life. And I've always found some way to engage with images and with uh, storytellers. Okay. So I don't know if you're aware, but our audience, it's uh, Spanish speakers. They're from everywhere, but not necessarily from, from the photo industry. So I would appreciate if you can explain us in a very simple manner, what does it mean to be a photo editor? Uh, that's, a, that's another great question. Uh, being a photo editor, so, well, sometimes the saying photo editing a lot of people interpret that as like doing Photoshop and toning and fixing your photographs. But when we say photo, when I use photo editor, a lot of us, some of us are in, in the industry, we often mean um, the person who is going to be looking at the images, selecting the images and sequencing the images. But also more importantly, I think, uh, at, at least at the National Geographic, and I think a lot of other publications, it means that you're also sort of the producer for the story. You do a lot of the research. You uh, help find situations for the photographer to photograph. You um, have a deep understanding of what the story is and how to tell the story uh, visually. And um, and it's a very, uh, I find it a very satisfying job a very pleasurable job to work with photographers and help them find what the story is, what are the best images to tell that story. And if, if you had to describe a photograph to someone that has never seen one before, how would you do it? You mean like, it's a, it's a, it's a two dimensional um, capture of of what we, what you are seeing it's gotcha. something that stops action stops motion it captures a moment in time it is generally uh flat as it were it's like on a printed page or in a print or on a screen and it's something that captures and holds time okay. and can be something very special it can be something very personal it can be historical um, and often beautiful, sometimes painful. Mm -hmm. And um, if you had to look back, right, I know you're a different moment in your career and we'll, we'll talk about that, but if you had to choose the biggest lesson in your career, what would that be? Um, I think the biggest lesson for me that helped a lot was um, being being a problem solver, how to be a problem solver. I think a lot of the work that a professional photographer does, or even an amateur, if they they want to try to make really special images, is you, you have to solve a lot of problems before you can take the photograph. You need to 
um, maybe get access to a location or you need to talk to people and have them be willing to let you photograph them. You have to solve technical problems. You have to solve, you have to know how to get there and how to get back. And I think being a problem solver is very, very important part of the job of being a professional photographer. So if, if I ask you what is the most important thing a photo ed editor does, would you answer uh, solving problems or would you add to your previous explanation? Um, that's, that's really hard because they're also uh, connected. Um, I think being a problem solver is, is yes, very like top of the list. I mean, top three or four things. I think also being uh, the, maybe one of the most important things as a photo editor is um, being able to uh, support uh, motivate and understand what the, the photographer's position and the photographer's vision for a story. Okay. Or and, book uh, or... Yes. And, and changing topics slightly, I mean, they're still connected, but I like to get a little personal with, with all my guests. If you had to highlight three lessons that life has taught you, uh, what would they be? What would you choose? Uh, be kind. Uh, I think it's very important how we treat one another. Um, be kind, be uh, trustworthy. And um, let's see, what's a good third one? Kind, trustworthy. Uh, I don't know. Those are like my two top things, I think. I'm trying to think of a third one, but nothing's coming to mind. Uh, be grateful. I think okay. that's another one is being kind, trustworthy, and grateful. I think uh, as just as a human being and as a, as a photographer. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you some random names. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to mention some names. I, I tried to do gather information, but it was tough. Let me tell you. My, my, my sources if they end up watching this, they were not so cooperative. Like normally they're more, but uh, they were all very tough cookies. Let's leave it that way. Uh, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to give you names and I want you okay. to tell us what have you learned from each one? Okay. Obviously uh, it's a human, so you could have learned many things. It's a complex question, but if you can summarize, sum up the lesson, into like a five lines that would be fantastic. So the first one is uh, Robert uh, Gilka. Oh, um, Robert Gilka, I think uh, definitely taught me uh, that problem solving part was one one big thing with him. I think it was like you know don't don't like don't complain. You know, don't uh, just get the job done. It's now, it's, once you have the assignment, it's your assignment and it's your responsibility to figure out how to, to complete the assignment. And it's okay. your job to do that research and figure it out. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I had a lot of, I had a lot of those people in my life. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. Hopefully I'm going to mention some of them. Uh, so the, the next one, probably you don't expect Let's see. Let's see. Let's see how good researcher I am. Susu. Susu. Oh, that's my cat. <laughs> what oh, have you learned that's... from from Susu? Yeah. Um. Sort of like stay stay young, you know. Stay uh, have a young attitude about life. Never stop playing and being curious. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about the? <laughs> It was tough, Sarah, let me tell you. It was not an easy task. Uh, and I didn't have much time. Uh, what about uh, Lynn Johnson? Oh, Lynn. Lynn is so important. Um, oof. Be respectful. I think she's all so much about her work and everything is about respect. Um, respecting the people that she works with. And I think being respectful to whoever 
allows you into their life to make a photograph? Um, hopefully I'll pronounce them correctly. That's why this is called Reflections with an Accent because I always mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's always going to happen. No worries. Uh, Lauren Steele. Oh, Lauren. Um, from Lauren, I think I've learned about being uh, sort of never giving up. Lauren's very tenacious at going after what she is, what she wants, and she doesn't give up. Okay, okay. What if I say Bill Maher? Mm. Oh, it was my husband. Um, okay. I think uh, he's taught me a lot about having patience because I see how much patience he has for me. <laughs> okay. And um, I think, yeah, a lot about patience. I think if you're, we've been married for a very long time, and I think uh, being patient is part of what keeps a, a marriage together. Okay. Okay. Wonderful answer. Uh, somebody that is going to be with us uh, two weeks from now, I think, Kathy Moran. Ah, Kathy. Um, Kathy is so much about. Uh, how do you make your dreams come true? You know, she is, uh, she is so good at what she's done. And she came from uh, like a different place from, not from journalism school, not as a photographer, but she learned and self-taught and learned from the people she worked with. And I think it's all about like not giving up your dreams, going after your dreams. Okay, you know, you know the uh, the message behind this channel is never stop dreaming. Uh, that's right. That's, that's right, and that's right. Every single that's video, you. that's that's the idea behind this. Yes. Inspire Don't give others up. to to dream and execute their dream if possible. That's uh, perfect. Sarah, what about uh, Shannon Simon? Oh, Shannon, um, she's uh, like is about being excellent, about excellence, and ne not ever settling for less than the best um, in terms of what her standards are for her own self and for her, who she's working with. Okay. I'm glad that uh, I'm choosing names that you want to say something about them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all in my life in one way or the other, and okay. uh, it's, it's very um, interesting. Okay, think so about what, what, in this way. what about someone that's, he was here in the channel before. So what about uh, John Stanmeyer, which I believe you have worked with him many times. Yes, John is about, um, it's about love. John is a lot about love, about loving, loving life, loving one another, um, about, about how the power of love. I think John, when I think of John, I think of, of how the power of love is what so much about what motivates him and what I, what I can absorb when I'm working with him. Okay. What if I say Elizabeth Christ? Mm, Elizabeth. Oh, she is. Wow. Uh, Elizabeth is someone who I um, like admire. I admire her so much and I admire her knowledge, her judgment, um, her, uh, everything about how she conducts herself in the world and in our photographic community. So generous. I think that's another really good word for about generosity. I think she's taught me a lot about being generous with um, sort of with our knowledge and our skills and, and it being in the world and how it's so important to be generous. Okay. What about, we're almost done with the names here. Joel Sartore. Oh, Joel. Being funny. Being funny is a very important skill. Humor. Using how you use humor and, and, being, and being funny. And humor can build a lot of bridges and can be really, really helpful in a lot of situations is to try to see the humor, sometimes be humorous,
but that's what I think about what Joel has taught me is about how to be embracing humor. Okay. And the last name that I have, who was also a guest here in the show when we began, is uh, Jean Richardson. Eugene Richardson. Well, Jean is, um, well, I think also Jean is like, like it's about how uh, age doesn't matter, right? How in terms of the work, right? You don't, it's not like, you know, maybe some athlete and you get too old to be able to do it, right? That you can, you can stay a photographer. You can always evolve. You can always get better. You can always um, try new things. And Gene is so much like he, he just keeps getting better and better. And it's, and it's inspiring to think that, you know, well, we can just keep going. We can keep, we're lucky we're in a profession that we can really just keep doing the work. You just have to evolve as you, as you age into the kind of work that you can do the best. So, so Sarah, if, if I ask you how and why did you become a, a photo editor uh, with National Geographic, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was working as a freelance photographer, uh, mostly for the National Geographic. And I think I did like 16 stories and had five covers. But I was uh, also, you know, when you're a freelance photographer, you're doing like all kinds of different things to make a living, you know, some teaching, some assignments, uh, you know, some all, you know, some editing. And I was doing so while I was teaching workshops about photography, I'm editing the photographer's work. And I really loved um I love that part of teaching was looking at the photographer's work and editing their work because it's so much easier to edit somebody else's work and as opposed to your own work is hard. And so I just really enjoyed doing it. And I, and I also, there was a period of time where sort of in between assignments, I was working with my husband um, <clears throat> on some book projects and doing some photography research and editing. And I just liked it so much. And I felt like less, I felt confident, more confident than what I was actually photographing. So uh, I always had it in the back of my mind that maybe someday I would like to be an editor. And a, a, a position opened up at the National Geographic, and at the time they didn't open up very often. And um, the uh, the head of the all the, the photo editing department um, was Chris Johns, and he I had worked with him in the past at a newspaper in Kansas, um, and he. Uh, I thought, well, if anybody's going to hire me <laughs> as a photo editor, maybe it'll be Chris. So uh, I just applied for the job and I got the job and I, I never looked back. I started photo editing. I stopped. Uh, I was in the middle of finishing a magazine story and I just I finished that. And then I started full time editing and I just really loved it. And the rest is, is history. Yeah. So I'm going to be asking. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about books later on. I have some questions, but I, I just that I believe you were involved in women on that book. Uh, yes. So I just want to I just want to show you something that is personal because um, one of my photographs was included in that book, and yes. yesterday I'm... we found the book with my daughter. Uh, oh. So she, she's holding the book, uh, and I thought that was. That was very funny. Like she was, you know, looking at photography yeah. books and saw my name, and and I thought that was very, very, very nice for her to to find. And it looks good. Looks good with that other photo, with that other vintage photograph too. They look yes. good together. So Sarah, the question that I have for you is: Can you think of your biggest failure that later in time became your greatest success? Oh, gosh. So something that in the moment you felt it was completely a disaster, the end of your career, the end of whatever it was, or uh, and then suddenly it became such a lesson that taught you something very important. I think I probably had one of those moments on every assignment I ever worked on. Um, I always felt that I, I think... I, every assignment I ever worked on, I'd have a breakdown moment where I'd be crying. 
because I felt like, you know, nothing was working out. Um, uh, you know, I was never going to work for them again because this was such a disaster. And it was usually, it was just it, often it was involved with, you know, not being able to get access to something that I thought was really important for the story or not being able to, you know, sort of figure out how to make a photograph or get to some place or just all, everything w w fall apart. Um, I had a, one particular situation in, um, in a story I was working on in Siberia where I had arranged to go out on the Lake Baikal uh, uh, with a bunch of fishermen and we had to get up there really early in the morning. Uh, my, we, I have, I have some of those photographs, but I'm, I'm okay. going to show them later. You can tell the story okay. and then we can look at them. But uh, Okay. So anyway, it was, I get there to with them and uh, they're, they're, they're not like they're all been drinking all night and they, decide they're not they're not ready to go and they're not going to go and i was it was a disaster for me because it was so important for me to get on that ice and do this and i just happened to see another group getting ready to leave and i just said to sasha let's go ask them if i can go with them and he explained everything and they said yes and i just jumped on the sled and went and, and my my translator didn't even come with me i just said i'll see you when we get back right but i think that maybe the lesson in all of this is that you, you make a plan. It's good to make a plan. It's good to have a plan, but it's even more important to, to be present in what's happening in the moment. And it, maybe the plan is not the best idea. And this other thing that's presenting itself is going to be better. So it's that, that serendipity and, and spontaneity is really important. And like, go ahead and make your plans, but be willing to chuck them out the window if the, if you see something better. Because generally, I think that little moment of serendipity when something comes along, if you if you don't and you just try to stick and be rigid with the plan, I think it's more important to like just say, "The heck with the plan. I'm going. I'm going over here." You know, and, and that applies to life too, right? Like many of these photo lessons apply to the reality of our own existence because uh, you have plans and then it ends up being something completely different. Um, yeah, and maybe better. And it's, sometimes it's a lot better uh, that the, that the found, the thing in the moment that you find is often going to be way better than that plan. Absolutely. I still believe in making the plans just to give yourself a sense of direction and security, but Personal I'm a big security, Yes. Yeah, uh, then, but then, then I'm a, but then be ready to throw throw it away if something is yeah. right in front of you. And I, I know you have had a, an an opportunity to, to experience the photo industry or the photo world in a very unique manner. Actually, many of the guests we have had here, they all have amazing careers. Uh, what changes have you seen in the industry? And what is your biggest concern regarding the future? Because I know you're in touch with younger photographers, upcoming, um, old timers. Mm -hmm. Where do you think we're heading? Well, I, I, I'm pretty, I'm hopeful about photography because I know there's so many uh, people who want to tell stories with photography or they want to um, be photographers. I think that, so I'm the, the, it's the end product. Like where is all this amazing photography going to go and how do photographers make up, make a living, like be able to live off of their photography. I think that's more the challenge than because so many um, public like newspapers that used to, when I was coming up, there were all these newspapers and you could get a staff job in a newspaper and, you know, have a career. And now so many of those are gone or um, they're, they're doing more online and that doesn't pay as well as print. So I think there's some economic issues that are, are a big challenge, but I also see that, that the younger generation uh, that is coming up, they are finding a way. They are find, uh, often finding a way to be a photographer in this new world. There, uh, there's so many more grants uh, for photographers and for visual storytelling. There's so many of um, uh, groups that are supporting photographers than used to be. I mean, we didn't have a lot of these groups that were around when I was coming up. And you know, we had like the newspapers and stuff like that. And so now I think that, um, you know, 
the the younger generations they're raised on photography they're raised on instagram and the, on all kinds of online photography and so they're kind of very sophisticated i think a lot sooner visually than than say than when i was coming up um i see like really amazing amazing work from younger photographers and it's so exciting and it's just a matter of like so how can we help them stay in the community stay working as photographers and i think it it's like still the freelance life it's it's not going to be one thing you know, you're going to have to, you might have to do, you might have to do some teaching and you might do some self-funded uh, projects and you might get some assignments and maybe you're going to do some commercial work. You know, maybe you're going to shoot a wedding or two or take some uh, advertising jobs, but it's all of that uh, often is what, uh, especially when you're starting out, um, is what's going to make it possible to continue as a photographer. Books. There's so many books. I have so many photographers doing Kickstarter projects and making books. So there's still a lot of opportunity. Absolutely. So before I proceed, I see my brother is connected from Spain. Hello, Nano. He's south of back there. So uh, I'm sure he's very late in Spain. So he will be surprised with this hello. So, so Sarah, <laughs> one of the things that has been um, my obsession or my mission, I was granted as a FINA Center Fellowship. This is my third year. So I'm completely, I was going to say obsessed, but I'm not really obsessed, uh, motivated to inspire younger generations. Okay. I think that uh, Kike might be changing his battery, so we're going to just... I am back, finished. I am back. Okay, who's this back? Is just, okay, who's this back? Is just to make it more exciting for my guests, you know, like I disappear, <laughs> so they don't know what is happening, and like, oh, he's gone. So what I was saying is that um, I write children books. We donated thousands uh, in remote communities in the Orinoco, in the Amazon. So the other day, I was speaking with uh, Sven Lindblad. I don't know if you had the chance to, to meet with him and, and many other guests mm -hmm. like with Wade Davis. So some of the conversations involve how do we make sure that future generations care about our planet, especially nowadays that everything is TikTok, Instagram, and there's such a disconnection between going out there and photograph an owl um, and you know, like, you know what I mean? Like younger generations, mm -hmm. they're obsessed with technology and photography mm -hmm. is not about technology. We use technology, but that's not the essence of what we do. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do we mm -hmm. think, how do you think we can inspire future generations to care about the environment and not be looking at a screen 24 seven? That's a really good question. And something that, um, I think is very, very important. I, uh, well, photography, uh, can be a wonderful tool to help people care about something. Um, you show them the beauty and the fragility and the uh, these amazing creatures and places, and then people start thinking like, "Oh my God, that's so gorgeous!" I, I, I of course, we want to keep that, right? We want to keep that in our world. I also think that there's nothing more um, impactful than than going there then seeing it for yourself and then becoming engaged and maybe making your own photographs of these amazing things. So, and travel is expensive and it's, and it's not for everyone, but there's what, what, what I think is another big change um, in our community is that how much more the internet has allowed uh, uh, photographers who are locally based to have a voice in telling their stories. So we don't need to like send somebody halfway around the world. There's really good photographers right there. And, um, and those photographers can help us with this uh, showing the the beauty and the fragility and how important these ecosystems and how we're all related and really we're all one, right? We it, and I think that's a, we can't say that enough that how much we need each other and we need the planet to be a safe place for us to live, and really now more than ever with the, some drastic weather going on all over the world, uh, we need to, we need to take care. And I think visually, whether video is great for that as well, but I think um, motivating and helping 
local photographers in areas to help document and tell these stories is really important. And for them to also engage their communities. So it's not just for the New York Times that we're doing this. We're doing this for one another and for your local community. Like what you're doing with the books and and things like that. It's like if if there's somebody in Colombia who's working on it, how do we help them not just um, get the word out globally or to the Western world, but get the world out those communities? Because if you can inspire those local communities to take care of what's around them, uh, that's really, really important. But we can never forget that you know nature you know like we want all the lions to be uh you know okay living and free in africa but we have to understand how dangerous it is to live with lions if you're living right there with them and how do we cross that bridge it's not just black and white you know that this is there's a lot of areas where we have to understand that you know nature as us tourists who are going there it's very different if you live there and how do we make that nature valuable to the people productive for them you know if you have you have a choice between feeding your children and cutting down trees so you can make the fire to feed your kids versus you know keeping the forest well, there's really no contest there. You're going to feed your children. So how do we make nature sort of be more productive for the people who are living there and safe? Yeah, I, was, I was having this conversation with my daughter, Pilar, she, Pili, she's seven, and she's obsessed with nature. And we were just brainstorming or thinking how boring would be this planet without this diversity of colors, yeah. places, cultures, food, traditions, dances, it would be a different place. So that's right. And I know we are we all changing an impermanent evolution, right? Like every trip we go to, we change every conversation. What would Sarah of today tell Sarah in her 30s? Mm. Uh, be patient. I was a pretty impatient person. Um, you know, I sort of I want it and then I want it now, you know, so I think uh, I was pretty impatient and I, I think because of my impatience, I was, I have, and it's not just, maybe not just when I was in my thirties, but I've been pretty demanding, you know, and I think that, uh, that pay, being patient um, and maybe a little less demanding would have been a good lesson for me um, as I was coming along. Okay. And uh, I don't know what you're going to think. Uh, um, how are you going to answer this question that I have now? <laughs> and I, know it's a, I know it's a tough one. If you have Uh-oh. to choose. Right, my mom tough ones. <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if you had to choose three books on photography, which ones would you choose and why? And I don't want you to, more about learning. So, um, something that you read something that is out of print so i'm not trying to promote anyone here this is more your personal opinion that many times or a long time ago you came across a book and you say wow like everybody should read this it doesn't have to be photos per se but on photography like Mm -hmm. susan sontag i don't know i was just gonna say susan sontag on photography Uh, yeah i read mine i I, I multitask I, I think that um, was a really important book for me. Uh, uh, it's the way she saw photography in a very different way helped, um, I think, helped help me a lot. It, and also, I think it was challenging. It's a cha- it's challenging photography, which I think is important to question what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, there's a, a little book. Uh, it's called In the Mind's Eye by Bresson. And okay. it's a wonderful little book about storytelling and the decisive moment and a lot of things like that. And I've used that book um, in, in when I'm teaching classes. You know, okay. there's a lot of quote, quote, wonderful quotations from that book. And uh, I'm trying to think another one that I've read. Um, oh, well, it's, it's not about photography, but it's the poetry of Mary Oliver. She's a, 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 a poet, and I think uh, 
that's that work has always been like very important to me because it's her poems are very visual, you know, and I can sort of see see the picture in her poetry. And there's something about it that I've always turned to that's been um, very, I don't know, very special and sustaining for me. The reason that I was asking Sarah is because I was lucky enough. I spent almost four years at Yale University as an auditor. And I was in a class with Todd Papa George as an auditor, mm -hmm. not for credit. And many of uh -huh. the readings that I did back then, they shape how I see things and everything that I read mm -hmm. afterwards are not always connected with photography. That's why your last book in reference to poetry, everything helps, right, to shape your yeah, vision. Absolutely. So wait, what were your three books? Oh, you're, uh, <laughs> you cannot no. ask, you cannot ask yeah. me this because, because yeah, I have yeah. to focus on my questions. Another thing no, you, you, should, you should tell us, you should tell us because I'd like to hear, I might learn, I might have some new books that I want to read. Ah, you're putting me here on the spot and I, ha I have a big, it's a conversation. I have a, I have a big, <laughs> big collections on photography that's a book as you said that's why i suggested first um more than readings what i've done is spend lots of time looking at visuals produced by other people um mm -hmm. and not necessarily the the nat geo traditional style that that mm -hmm. many people follow or we follow but artsy things and expected approach um and this is going to sound uh, funny, but books on sketching, uh, on, on drawing. I now have a, like a, a logbook, a diary, and I sketch. I have a, a, a diary with my daughter, all our adventures. So just the idea of start sketching the reality around me made me think about photography in a different manner. Um, yeah. But I don't want to. I don't want to mention books because remember this is my channel, and, and many people will come here, and I don't want to. I want everybody to. I want everybody to to show up very soon. I'm gonna have the um, the director of the Gabriel Garcia Market Foundation. Actually, he will be here. Ooh. Well, that book, that Hundred Years of Solitude, was one of my favorite books. I think I've read it. I've at least read it twice. I think it's very, very important. Amazing book. And I'm, I'm friends with the uh, nephew of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. So I have had long conversations about uh, the family, the house, and he has just published a new book about the Marquez family, by the way. Nice, nice. Still, I would love to read that. Still Big in fan. So if, um, if you had to name three people who changed the course of your life, who would they be? Well, you, t you mentioned Bob Gilka. For sure, Bob uh, changed the course of my life uh, once I got the internship and, um, and he helped me get my first uh, uh, staff job at a newspaper with Rich Clarkson, the Topeka Capital Journal. Um, Mary Ellen Mark. Uh, I met Mary Ellen um, on the um, Day in the Life books. That was a series of books done by uh, Rick Smolin and uh, for HarperCollins. And uh, it was a, these, it would be the day in the life of some country like Soviet Union or Spain or Vietnam and 50 or so photographers would all go over and be sent around and um, shoot for 24 hours. And I uh, room uh, Mary Ellen was my roommate on uh, in in uh, I think tile in was it Italy I think and then we got to be really good friends and she was really supportive and helpful for me um, and I'm trying to think of there's so many people I feel bad that I'm going to be missing very important people um, I would also say Rich Clarkson. He was um, my first, my probably my one of my first staff jobs. So this is all way, way long time ago, um, and but he, and then Chris Johns, I guess I would put Chris too, who hired me as a photo editor. He, he was very important. But, it, but it's interesting, Sarah, that when you look back, there's people that show up in our life, and sometimes we don't expect it, but they help us fork our life into one direction. It could have been to the left, and suddenly we're facing a different route, a different project, and the rest yeah, is history, right. right? Right. And I think it's so important that, you know, uh, 
if you're in the if, if you're in our career like our both of us we've been in our careers for some time and all along the way there were people that uh helped you know that gave you good advice that looked at your pictures that um gave you feedback that might have helped you with a job or a recommendation or something and i feel like um and that's something that i'm very committed to doing now, you know, is uh, not just uh, honoring all of that help that I got by trying to help other photographers, you know, help them. I write lots of recommendation letters. I talk to people and look at their work and give them feedback. And I think it's so important that we, we stay help, stay very helpful and supportive of one another as you go through your career. Absolutely. I always, I always mentioned that uh, Carl Safina, that eventually he might watch this interview. He changed how I perceive my career. I was I was aiming through a particular direction, and some of the conversations we had in Patagonia, because we sailed together, changed something in my mind, and um, I became a different person. Not only because of him, but it was it was very influential in a in a very positive way. So I always play the game of words, uh, Sarah. I'm going to tell you a word or three words, and you need to tell me an experience, a thought, a memory, and hopefully you can elaborate a little bit. I don't know who, who he was, but he, he answered with only one word. I'm like, no, no, I need a little more. The idea is to make it this a little fun, you know? The, so people get, get to know you as, okay. as, a, as a human. So, okay. So the, the first one, you were a tough one. Honestly, normally, normally I, I gather much more in-depth information. This one was not so easy. So what about if I say Topeka, Topeka Capital Journal? Topeka Capital Journal was, I would say, the place where I really learned to be a professional photographer. I... Uh, I was there only for two years, a little more than two years. And I learned how to, uh, I, I spent three months of the of each year photographing at the state capitol, photographing government. And uh, it's, it was very challenging because it's lots of people in, in rooms having meetings, you know, and, uh, and it's, you know, back then, for sure, it was a lot of men in suits. And it's like, oh, my gosh, what are you going to do? And I, I, I really figured out how to, uh, it's sort of like shooting sports. And I don't shoot sports. But I imagine it's like shooting sports where you need to understand the game. So you need to understand like the the how the what they're doing and how the laws are being made and all of that, and then you need to know who's who are the players and what's significant about them. So if one guy is talking to another guy, that's a big deal. And if you don't know who they are or what their issues are, you would not know that and not be able to make that picture. So I uh, I learned a lot about research and problem solving there. After I worked there, I felt like I could I could do anything. You're, you're, you're making me smile because you're, you're remembering me, my first job. I was, I, was an, I was an intern at the United Nations in New York. Okay. So I learned how to develop black and white film photographing Kofi Annan and the, the General Assembly. So yes. uh, I'm just laughing because at that time, that job trained me to do so many things Caption yeah. photos with a top writer. Uh, yeah. But me too. Uh, I, I, I had to learn how to um, because we were the ca capital city of Kansas. Uh, the AP, we, we I had to give pictures and send pictures to the AP, and I had to type out the captions and the old fashioned way you send photos uh, for the AP. So I learned a lot about being self sufficient. Mm. And if I, if I say, Sarah, Uganda. Uganda was um, uh, my very first story for the National Geographic magazine when I was an intern. I was sent to Uganda to uh, follow a couple. He was Canadian and she was Ugandan and they were married and 
they were out of the country for seven years while their Idi Amin was in charge and there was conflict there. And after he was deposed, they came back and I was sent back with them. And we, I spent three months with them in Uganda. And, you know, you asked a question earlier about like, what was a big failure and, um, you know, what did I learn from it? Well, the very first day we went from Kenya and drove into Uganda, you know, that reunion, she was going to see her mother and her family. Um, and that to me was a very big, important moment that I had to get right. And I, you know, I had all these visions and ideas of what it was going to look like. And by the time we got there for so many delays and being held at the border, um, you know, we got to the house where it was and it was way dark and it was late and the light was terrible and it didn't turn out at all the way I thought it was going to turn out. And I was absolutely devastated and thought that, you know, the story was a failure before it had even begun, but we recovered and we did the story and I recovered from that. And I think I learned a lot um, uh, about patience, about, you know, about failing, but not giving up. And, you know, you just got to learn from, you know, I think that I always say that, you know, there's no such thing as failure. There's only quitting. Yeah. Right. And I think you just don't, you can't quit. As long as you don't quit, you're, you're not failing. Always moving forward. Like everything in nature, when you start moving, it's over. So yeah, that's right. The next the next question that I have, I mean, not the next question, the next word sentence, hopefully I'm going to pronounce it correctly. This is going to be one of my non-pronounced uh, <laughs> words. Uh, uh, Ritenor High School. Ritenor. Oh, Ritenor High School. Rit okay, Ritenor. yeah. Ritenor. 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 Okay, I was, Ritenor. I was, reading, I was reading in French. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that... Uh, well, so I was. This is my high where I went to high school. So I, it was a very big school, three thousand kids, huge, and um, you know I was the kind of person in high school where I, you know, I just joined everything, clubs and you know activities, and I, you know, there'd be some piece of paper up and sign up for this, and I'd sign up for everything. So there was one that was for the American Field Service. And the American Field Service was a, a foreign exchange student program. So I signed up. I was a junior and you could sign up for the summer program as a candidate. A senior got a whole year. It was after they graduated. Uh, so I signed up, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't spend any time really thinking about what that meant. And so you start going, you have a lot of different interviews and you meet a lot of different people and talk to them. And lo and behold, I was chosen as the student to go, um, to go somewhere and you don't know where you're going to go. Uh, you don't find out until about oh, three weeks, maybe before you leave. And, you know, I was like, I was like a total typical American high school girl. You know, I'm thinking Sweden, Amsterdam, you know, <laughs> Paris, I'm going, you know, somewhere, you know, like that. And then I find out uh, three weeks before I'm going to Turkey and I didn't know anything about Turkey. And I was not. like, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and I was like very unhappy about this, that I was going to Turkey. I thought, you know, I was going to go some, you know, London or something. Uh, and I was, uh, so, but, and of course I went and, um, you know, we, we get, have a crash course in the language and a lot of stuff with everybody. And then your family comes to pick you up and the family came to pick me up and, uh, it was the mother and the father. And there was a, the daughter Nisha and Nadir. And, uh, you know, and, and they've got a house full of people waiting to meet me, you know, and Nisha was very shy and she was the only one who spoke any good English and she didn't really want to. So I'm sort of like, you know, she got tired of doing it. And so anyway, we go to this house and the whole time, I mean, you know, they, they were the most amazing family. And I did not appreciate that on day one. Right. All I could see was how culturally different we were you know they were they were um muslims uh they didn't have a car they didn't have a television you know i was just like this total brat right and i was i mean of course i sat there i was polite i ate everything they fed me no matter what it was but i kept i would leave and i would go in the bathroom and i'd just cry like a baby 
I just thought, how am I going to do this? How am I going to, how am I going to last for three months? Um, well, that night, it's a little bit of a long story. I'm sorry about it. I got sick as a dog. I got so sick. I was like everything, my entire body exploded. I know that's too much information for you, but I was so sick and I was a mess and I was, and I was looking for somebody because everybody was sleeping all over the place. And I went into the one room and that's where um, uh, the, my, my Turkish mother and grandmother were. And I was just crying and they just kind of scooped me up and put me in the bathtub and gave me a bath and put me to bed. And I had a fever for three days. And for the, those three days, they you know, brought a doctor in. They Somebody sat by my bed and put cold towels on my head and read to me you know, from the Quran and in Turkish. And by the end of three, those three days, I was a different person. Nothing changed my life more than that in, uh, because all of a sudden I was so humbled and I felt so loved and I just felt so much love for them. And it was like the best thing that could have happened to me was getting sick like that and having them take care of me. And, and I think that's what turned me into a person who I realized that, you no, know, America is not everything. It's not the whole world. And it's actually a small percentage of people live like we do here, you know, and how rich the rest of the world must be. And I wanted to see it. Absolutely. If I say University of Missouri or School of Journalism. Yeah, well, I started, uh, that's where I went to college and I started out as a fine art major um, and I learned photography first in, in the, in, as a fine art doing, you know, four by five, you know, zone system, um, doing uh, gum by chromate prints and all kinds of alternative processes. And then, uh, but I couldn't really, you know, get a job, you know, doing anything. So I went back to school. I had a boyfriend and he was a photojournalist at the time. So I went back to school in journalism and um, that's where I learned how to be, you know, how to, about journalism and the ethics and storytelling and history and, um, so it really set me on my path, you know, and then I won the, the college photography year. And here's a picture of me in Uganda wearing the traditional uh, clothes, um, and, and had them take my picture. So, uh, one, one last word for you, um, Sarah, if I say scholarship, I think you won two scholarships that they were very meaningful to you in the past, uh, Fujiyama, maybe, and, mm -hmm. uh, John P. Herrick, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, so. mm -hmm. Well, these were uh, uh, journalism scholarships that um, I, I won while I was there, which helped, you know, pay for um, my tuition and my books and everything like that. Uh, so I think that, you know, now there's a, a lot of amazing grants out there for photographers. I really uh, encourage people to look at them if they're working on a project to see if there's something that it would be a good fit for them. Cause there's a lot of um, wonderful grants, a lot of them for women, for uh, non-binary grants, for um, people from all walks of life and cultures. There's a lot of amazing grants out there that are worth uh, worth looking for. And I, they definitely helped me be able to afford what I would, wanted to do. Absolutely. And if, if you, I'm just curious, where was this photo taken? This is uh, in Topeka, Kansas at the okay. state house. This is uh, the, you know, uh, a meeting is breaking up some kind of a meeting somewhere. And, you know, I, because I was there all the time, every day, all day long, I just kind of, everybody knew me and I got to kind of do a lot of whatever I wanted. So I'm just climbing up on the table to get a better view of something. <laughs> and uh, if you had to start everything over again, would you change something? Um, gosh, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You know, I think that um, I think everything that I've uh, the choices that I've made or the opportunities I've had have all been really uh, like gifts uh, to me for me. And I learned so much in all the various walks of life from newspapers to magazines to, you know, being a photographer to being a photo editor. I, I don't I'm trying to think I'm, I'm sure there are some different things, but um 
I can't think of anything off right off my head, right off the top of my head that I would change very much. I, I, I liked, you know, for me, I, I find it, um, I think there's a quote, I think I sent you this quote about what Man Ray said, you know, life's too short to do anything twice. <laughs> so I sort of have used that as a, as a guiding star. Okay. Okay. And what two things do you need, do you think the photo industry needs today? If you had to highlight two things, what would they be? Um, let's see. I think diversity is at the top of the list for me. Uh, we worked. We were working very hard while I was there. Those last several years, I was there to diversify our um, the photographers that we worked with, the writers that we worked with. I think that. Um, It's only a shame that we came so late to the conclusion that how important that is. Um, I think diversity is really, really something we all have to get behind and rebalance the scales. Um, I think, uh, and supporting photographers, supporting young photographers. I think that's uh, how do we how do we make it so that photographers can make a living doing this work because we need this work to be done. We need visual storytellers out there telling stories, but we have to figure out ways for them to be able to afford to do it. And Sarah, so I know you started, uh, you've been editing uh, photography books on your uh, new stage mm -hmm. in life. So I want mm -hmm. you to talk us a little bit about uh, What have you been doing? I'm going to put some images here. Hopefully technology is going to uh, behave. Um, <laughs> so this is you in, uh, in editing. Uh, but tell us yeah. a little bit about uh, those books that you have been involved and why are they important mm -hmm. and why are they important? Mm -hmm. Not the authors so, in particular, but the, the concept, the, uh -huh. the overall. Um, so the first picture of me sort of editing that's from a uh, photography workshop where I, I I like to teach photo editing so I'm teaching um, I teach for Santa Fe workshops the main media and that one was for the photo Lux festival in in Italy and during that I met um, the photographer of this book Habibi uh, Antonio Facciolongo and that book won the World Press Photo Book Award which is published by photo So th that way I was able to not, I met the publisher of this book and um, I, Antonio asked me to edit, photo edit. So I worked with the publisher, Svetlana Bacevanova, Ramon Pez, the really wonderful designer. And um, since then I've been, I've worked on, well, like, Uh, there's two more of, of, of photo evidences books that have just published recently. Um, Diego Abarro Sanchez's book about uh, Lebanon. That's one of the pictures from that. His the 11 years of living there. And Smita Sharma's book about um, uh, sex and domestic trafficking of young girls in India, Nepal and Bangladesh. So I, I got this, I had this amazing relationship with photo evidence and they, And, and she uh, offers me books to edit, or sometimes and Diego and Smita both ask for me. Um, next year, we're going to be working on a book for our, uh, about Ukraine, and it's going to be a, a, a number of different photographers. What I like about working with the photo evidence books is that um, Svetlana is very uh, committed to social justice and, and, and photojournalism and books that are telling stories Um, about issues, social issues in the world. So all of her books are kind of are generally confronting and talking about some very interesting, important topics. So I love working on, on those books. I've also been doing some books with photographers who are self-publishing. Um, I've done with two different German photographers, uh, Joanna Maria Fritz about um, Islamic circuses and... Uh, Uh, Petra Barth about her personal work on her various travels, a beautiful black and white book. And Anoush Babajanyan, who's a Armenian photographer with the Seven Photo Agency about uh, no, Nagorno-Karabakh. So some of it, you know, comes to me through Svetlana. Some of it are photographers who I've worked with. They, they may be taking my photo editing class or some of them, Petra and John, I met in portfolio reviews. Um, this is a picture from Smita's book, We Cry in Silence. Both of them, 
you can go check out the photo evidence uh, bookstore and uh, you can order the books from them. And uh, I, I, I find, I love working on photography books. I've, you know, it's such a, it's like 3D chess compared to um, a magazine because a magazine, it's always the same size. You have the same paper. You often have sometimes the same ratio of text to photographs and a book is sky's the limit. You know, how many pages, what size, what kind of paper, there's all kinds of things you can do with the book and the design, you know, working with the designer is so important and figuring out, uh, you know, what the photographer really wants this book to be. A, a book is such a personal statement by the photographer, you know, how to help them get their vision across and the story they want to tell. So I've been really, really lucky these past three years to, um, be having this chance to like learn something in a way like new, you know, working on books that each one is a new challenge. And I find it uh, really rewarding. I love, I love working on the books. And I love teaching. I, I teach, I have a workshop coming up at the end of October and there's still some spaces open. If you're interested, you have a project. Okay, okay, that's a hold on. Okay, hold on, Sarah. Let me, <laughs> let, me put you, let me put you full screen so people can see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I teach, I, what I, the teaching that I do now, it's not about how to photograph. It's about if you have long-term projects or you have a lot of work and you're maybe looking to, to turn it into a book or an exhibit, or you just want to figure out your portfolio or you want to make a story pitch or apply for a grant. So what I like to do is help photographers learn how to organize their work so that they can begin to edit and then edit their work uh, for whatever their goal is, you know, to usually like a two week class with some three days a week, there's classes and there's individual meetings. And uh, I think it's a skill because it's very hard to, uh, you know, edit your own work. You know, and, and organizing it up front is so important to help you. And then what I like to, I believe that the editing that you do sort of begins while you're photographing. And that doesn't mean deleting or choosing. It means thinking about what, what do you want? How do you want this work to live in the world? And did you get everything that you're going to need? To, to, let, to let, let me let me ask you let me ask you a question. Um, what, so, what makes a good story, Sarah? Um, I think a good story is something. Uh, it, it's something that you can get people to care about. It's like, how do we get people to care about about what, we, what you care about? So, you might you care about something, Kiki. Well, how do you get people to care about what you care about? I think a good story can do that, mm -hmm. it, it, but you have to be able to engage people's emotions. The, you know, the caring starts with feeling something about something else. That's not you. Right. So if I, if it's pandas, how do I get you to care about the pandas or the pandas environment? You know, what are those kind of pictures that are going to make me connect, connect with this thing that you're passionate about and photography can do that. And that's when it can start to perhaps make a difference. And I, I and love this answer, but I also, I also have a question for you. I love books. I love the smell of books. Uh, I, I have a big collection. When you ask me a book about photography, uh, I don't have as many as Gina Martin, but I have me, like so me many. Too. <laughs> me too. Me too. Me too. And many times they're, they're signed or, uh, yeah, like they're my memories and my lessons. But the question me that I have too. for you is, and I'm confronted with this, with the adventures of Pili, and I've been lucky enough to donate thousands of books at this point in remote places. But the other day I was talking with somebody involved in technology and he was addressing the question, not addressing, asking me, do you think you will transition? Because, for example, shipping a book is costly. Uh, but I can tell a story. I can make people care with a YouTube channel, which is why you see me here. You can educate through uh, social media, if done properly, or eBooks, or all these options that technology is going to bring, like the Nat Geo magazine transition into in that very particular moment in time. You know, people were not mm -hmm. buying the actual magazine. How do you transition? into different mm -hmm. platforms. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on what the future um, has for us in, um, 
I don't know what's the, the expression. I was going to say in Pub Spanish. Publishing. Like yes. publishing, you know? Yes. Well, I, I think that everything will exist. I don't think anything's going to go away. I don't think books are going to go away. I don't think prints are going to go away. I think it's all going to exist. So you, so, and I think we have to use everything. I think we have to publish online. We have to publish on your phone. Uh, I think books are, books are sort of more like a love affair, right? It's like, you know, I, I, I love books. I love objects. I love, you know, because we're, photographers are, are creative people. They want to make something, you know, they want to make a book. They want to make a print, but that doesn't mean, to get the message out, you're exactly right, is you've got to, you've got to do it all. And, you know, like I, I, it's sort of like how, you know, film has gotten popular again, you know, film, film is making a big comeback. There's a lot of young people who, you know, they come to, up to me and they go, I shoot film, you know, like they just discovered it, you know, yesterday, but, and it's great because they think that, so everything will stay, uh -huh. everything will remain. And what I think to get, to tell your stories, you you put them on every platform. You you put them all, you use every bit of technology we have to get the the message out and to reach people. You can't force them to come to you. You we have to go to them. And 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 what and and digital is is absolutely fine. For Smita's book, um, it's it's got it's in three languages, but she's making an entire another. They're making an entire another uh, other version of that book in in like a newsprint version. Uh -huh. that can be distributed more locally that will be pennies on the dollar for or, or trying to buy this book. So, you know, and she's, she's got a, a lot of ideas for educational campaigns around these issues of these girls that are, tra that are, be that are being trafficked and there's th tens of thousands of them. So I think that, you know, we, we have to do everything. And, and, and what's nice is it's all available to us. Some of it's more expensive. Definitely making a book is more expensive than putting it on a website or putting it on YouTube. But I think if that's, if that's something that most photographers, every photographer I know wants to make a book, I, I, you know, that's their goal. Of course. You ask them, what, you know, so it's good, but it's just, you have to realize that it's, it's cost, it costs, it costs money to do it. And a lot these days, photographers, publishers, their profit margins are very small. And unless they're sort of your sort of a well-known name, you know, you have to bring money to the table uh, to a publisher and they'll distribute, but they're going to want some of the production costs covered. Uh, and that's why you see so many Kickstarter campaigns. Photographers are raising money to get their books made. And if, if you had to lay like a very simple blueprint of what is creating a book, what would that be? Can you, in a very simple manner, can you say number one, number two, um, what, what are the steps, the obvious steps in your opinion? Well, you know, the first is to ha have something that's, you know, I, I guess, I, mean, I don't know if this sounds harsh, but have something that- to say? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, having something worth being in a book, like everything yeah. doesn't have to be a book, right? Yeah, totally. A lot of, you know, photographers who have really are just in a way starting out, you know, the first thing they want to do is a book. Well, maybe it's not the first thing. It really depends on the work. Like, do you have something that has something to say that ought to be a book and it's going to reach an audience who are going to want to ha have that book, you know, uh, and, and, and wait, Wait till your project is ready. Then, I then you know the one of the very next things to do is um, can you find a somebody who wants to distribute it? You know, can you find a publisher who wants to you know help with the with the printing and the organizing of it and get it distributed? And they're going to be the ones who are going to be mailing it all out and that kind of thing. So that you know, how do you meet publishers? Well, you know. There's a lot of so there's publishers who come to portfolio reviews that are happening everywhere all the time with all these photo festivals. Um, there's some online uh, resources for finding publishers, um, and a lot of a lot of photo books get done, and they don't have someone like me editing them. The the photographer just works directly with the designer. Then finding the designer, and then and coming up with the money. Is it a Kickstarter campaign? Can you get a grant? Can you get uh, a company to help sponsor it? 
um, there's all those things that are in, in the take to be taken into consideration. And who, and you know, who's the audience? Who do you think is going to want this book? Uh, besides maybe just photo book collectors, you know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things to take into consideration making a book. Uh, but it's a fascinating world. I, I love books. Uh, Me too. I'm obsessed now with the children books, but I think they're just a, it's like a legacy. Yeah, it's a legacy. And, you know, it's something you can take and show your mom. And, you know, it's like, I think that, um, and I love them. And I love the variety and the different ways people are making photo books. And uh, there's just so many there's too many that's for me there's too many i can't afford them all right so it's but um yeah some people have too many shoes women i guess and and i have probably too many books <laughs> and and sarah uh, i always ask uh, our guests here can you share with us something that people will be surprised about you it can be anything um, I mean, don't tell me anything that YouTube is going to block my channel, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like, let's that, see. Something unexpected, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not doing this right now but because I've moved a couple of times, but I was uh, um, very obsessed with raising and having a Japanese uh, koi. For okay. a, a number of years, you know, I had a pond and I had like a dozen fish that I was raising and uh, I, I used to go to fish shows for koi and I got very, learned a bunch of Japanese words about the koi and I was just very obsessed with them for, for okay. uh, I don't know, a long time. And uh, they say that it's very meditative to have these fish. Yeah. And looking at them, and and when you're collecting the fish and putting a little uh, school of fish together, it, you're creating a painting. Mm -hmm. So you, it's like picking the fish, you're picking the colors, you're picking everything. You're trying to create this meditative thing that you sit and watch, and uh, you've created this moving painting. And and uh, may uh, I ask how the, this whole thing got started? Did you travel to Japan? You were, were you exposed to the no. Uh, I, oh, I, when we first moved from, um, uh, I, I was moving to Washington DC first, I was living in Maryland and the backyard came with like a little bitty pond and it had some fish in it. And a, my friends sent me some more fish for it because, uh, some of them died over the winter because I didn't know anything about fish or how to take care of fish. And they sent me it to two koi and that I learned what they were and what these other fish were. And I learned how to take care of them. And then I got into the history of these fish and um, okay. the, what they mean in Japanese culture. And I just got deep into it. <laughs> so so when, when, when I read about this uh, koi fish population decreasing in a particular moment in time is when you got started, you were pretty much killing all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, they, yeah, well, I, the, I, they had this goldfish and you, you can't let the entire surface of the pond freeze okay. over. Right. You have to create a little hole for them. to So they'll overwinter just fine underneath there, but the gases have to be let out. And I didn't know about this. So, uh, so I killed a few fish. Yes. And then I felt <laughs> terrible. And then I had to learn about how to keep them alive. <laughs> okay. So th thank you for sharing. And um, is there a piece <laughs> of, is there a piece of technology you cannot live without? If you had to choose something, is there something in particular that has become your thing uh i would say my phone you know phone. because uh yeah i think so because i've you know it's got you know I, I can use it as a camera i can be in touch with people i can i can do research on it i can look at photography on it um i would say that that's probably that's probably the piece of technology i'm most engaged with it's okay. my phone, like like millions of others with my phone and everything that's going on on my phone. So, Sarah, I know we've been chatting for a while. Do you have a few more minutes to look at some of your work? Is that is that sure. okay? Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, instead of me asking questions, uh, I'm gonna. Why don't you tell us what is happening? I'll 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 do it at a rhythm, right? Okay. Uh, okay. I just, 
explain us what is happening. Why do you think it's a good photograph? Uh, what were you okay. thinking when you shot it? Anything you want to share with us that would okay. be valuable? Um, this is a, a story I did for the magazine about um, Jenne, which is a very special town in Mali in West Africa. Um, the story had some archaeology aspects to it, but this is the Grand Mosque in Jenne, and I was um, that I had to have a good picture of that. And this is the women cleaning up on market after market day. This is a. Uh, um, um, a Quran school where the kids le memorize, learn the Quran. And so it's a uh, Islamic uh, population there. So I needed things about uh, the re religion and I just love this uh, school and the light coming in and it's early in the morning and the kids are tired. And um, yeah, it's a moment. I, I, uh, I, I didn't... Are you still shooting at all these days or not? No? no, just my, just for fun, my phone, you know, but not nothing serious. Uh, this is in Canada. I did one of the first the, the first story I did uh, coming back to the magazine um, later after working in newspapers for a few years uh, was about the U.S. Canada border. And so I spent a really long time going back and forth at all the border. And this is one of the pictures uh, from a Mennonite community um, in, uh, in in Alberta. And it's all you know. This is for me. It's all about the light. Um, it's big storm that was coming in, and this is a canola field, and one of the Mennonite uh, uh, kids going through, and it's just a, it's a landscape, you know, with the with the person in it, and it gives you that sense of place. I think sense of place is really important in the geographic stories. Uh, I did a story about oil. Uh, I did a few uh, by, stories. By the way, about sorry, oil. sorry that I interrupt. Uh, I'll be having no. on the on the show uh, Bob Chris, hopefully before the end of the year. And I remember okay. I still have his book, uh, Sense of a Place, in my bedroom in Spain. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, Bob's a very good friend of mine, and he lives up here in Maine in the same town that I live in. Okay. You know, okay. So, yeah, so I see him a lot. Um, this okay. is a story. I did, I did some energy stories about different uh, alternative energy, and one was about oil, and this was um, – uh, a story about uh, this is one of the big oil fields in, in Southern California and another sense of place. Um, I did a story about uh, skin. Uh, we, we did a whole story about skin and a lot of the pictures um, were like sort of photo illustrations where I had to come up with uh, ways to explain different things about skin and sensitivity and just all kinds of, a lot of research for this story. But one of them was about uh, sort of prosthetics and for, uh, you know, uh, and there was a place in England that made, you know, did make fake skin and, and stuff for movies and stuff like that. So we hired a woman in England to go and have her face made. So it could show how you could create this, like this artificial, real artificial skin, and then this kind of other kind of skin. And so then she, we flew her back to the States and I took her in the studio. And this is a picture of her face, the mask, you know, and she's just holding it, kind of looking at, at, at herself. Wow. Such an interesting photograph. And, and, and at the yeah. same time, such perfection in the craft of the face. It's like, wow. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And this was just, you know, I did, I'd learned how to do studio work and lighting uh, back when I was working at newspapers because you do everything there. So uh, all that kind of came in handy on some, some of these assignments. This was a story in um, I did in Mexico about a Popocatepetl, which is the the um, volcano uh, near Puebla, not about eighty, you know, maybe miles outside of Mexico City, and it was it was getting active, and so there was this whole program that they were doing on like how people could leave, but there's a it, it had it, if it erupted, um, so I, I spent uh, some some weeks down there and but popo el popo has uh, a lot of um, sacred significance to the communities there you know that he's they call him uh, don gregorio and so in the foreground you see a catholic church that was built on top of an older aztec mm -hmm. temple and then you have popo in the background you know and i love the um i love the juxtaposition of the sort of the two religions in a way very, very beautiful image. It reminds me um, 
There was a moment in time when I was shooting slides that I was experimenting with tungsten light photograph with daylight. And yeah. Everything, and everything became became blue, but it's blue. this one's not that, but no, I no, also no. I, don't, I, don't mean, yeah. I know, but I, I used to do it. I'm just saying that this reminds me experiment yeah, yeah. that I did back then. It's a beautiful shot. I, I used to uh, I used to experiment with tungsten uh, film that way too, but you know there's what they call the blue hour, and there's kind of the, yeah. this time, you know, and you just got to get position and wait, you know. But all of these pictures that you're showing are uh, are slide film. I Maybe. I really stopped. Yeah, and this is in a um, um, a, a town, um, and it shows the exit route for the town painted on the wall, the evacuation route. Evacuation. Um, yeah, so it was kind of like one of those um, those uh, things where you're you're always looking for like, can I get Popo in the photo somewhere or some represent re representation of El Popo? Uh, but this was um, uh, there was an event happening in this uh, plaza, and these all these guys were just hanging out on this fountain, uh, looking at it. And it was, this was an old sort of Spanish colonial. Uh, some architecture and stuff like that. So it's just a little bit about the history of the of Mexico in this in this region. And that's, oh, and that's uh, me. I know. <laughs> that's me. Uh, wait, I think this uh, is I did, Baikal, right? This is this yeah. Is, this is Lake Baikal, and uh, I, I did. This is in the early like 1991 when Perestroika was just uh, starting to happen, and uh, and things were opening up, and I got this assignment to do the story about Lake Baikal. It's the deepest freshwater lake in the world, and um, I spent two two trips, uh, each about two months long. Um, so quite a lot, a lot of time for uh, back then for stories. Um, and in the, in the winter time, we drove around, um, uh, we had two trucks, slept in one truck and another truck was like a kitchen truck. And then in the summer and better months, we went around the lake by boat and we took that motorcycle with the sidecar on the boat. And that's what um, my translator, Sasha, uh, he and I used to get around in the, in the, uh, you know, when the, it wasn't snowy and stuff like that. And we just put all my gear in the sidecar and I would ride around in the back. Um, so I photographed, you know, it's kind of a typical in a way geographic story. What are the cultures? What is the land like? What are the people doing? There are a lot of um, some indigenous groups there we spent some time with. Uh, and yeah, it was uh, a fantastic. I absolutely loved working on that story. And then I did another one in Siberia. Um, not too long after this in Kamchatka. So I learned a lot of Russian. I love languages. I love trying to learn languages. Um, there's uh, only one of the few places, I think there's only two places that have uh, freshwater seals. This is the Kamchatka story and Kamchatka is just north of Japan and it hangs down like a big teardrop and it was closed uh, to uh, Westerners and even to many Russian Russians for a long, long time because it had nuclear submarine base there. And then they de decommissioned after the perestroika decommissioned um, the base and uh then we were able to go in and not a lot of people had been there so it was amazing a uh, place uh, has lots of volcanoes a uh, very interesting towns people there i spent a lot of time with fishermen both in lake baikal and here uh, in kamchatka um and i just loved everything about it i i loved the the life was just so simple. I mean, you know, you you didn't have the distractions uh, and that you have here. You could just really everything everything small becomes really important. Like just having a bath and cl cleaning your clothes and preparing your food. It all got lots of it, more attention to it, and and in a way more pleasure. You know, because. Uh, these things are so important. And I spent a, some time with the um, Koryak reindeer herders, which was one of my favorite things going out on the tundra when they do their annual harvest. Uh, they Twice a year, they'll take uh, some reindeers for food and clothing. And um, it was, uh, I mean, I was, it was a gift. I was, I just feel so privileged that I got to do these things and go to these places uh, when at the time I got to go. They, they look uh, fantastic, Sarah. So, 
I think, uh, I mean, I would love to keep on talking and talking, but uh, <laughs> I need to bring it up to an end. And also because I'll run out of batteries. I don't know why my camera gets overheated. And I also <laughs> have one of these cables and still does not work. But I just have one last question for you. Um, okay. my, my saying is never stop dreaming. That's how I end up many of my communications in any media. I always say never stop dreaming. Um, and I ask my guests, can you grab that expression or that sentence, make it yours? And imagine this is a time capsule uh, for the future. What would you yeah. say around the concept of never stop dreaming? Um, well, I think I've never stopped dreaming about what's next and what I can do and what 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 I would like to do. Uh, I think dreaming is about hoping and then, and then making your dreams come true. Uh, and if you're not dreaming, you know, you're missing out on maybe some amazing things that you could possibly do in your life. Uh, I, I think I've dreamt, you know, I dreamt about working at National Geographic and I dreamt about editing and, and now, you know, and I love photo books. I dreamt about being more involved in photo books and, you know, slowly, slowly persistence, really trying, working at it. You know, you can make those dreams come true. And, um, and I, I, I don't think I'll ever stop dreaming. And I hope to encourage the people I work with to always keep dreaming too, just like what you're, you're doing, Kike. I'm trying. And it's important. Me too. And I think it's really important that we, you know, like they say, pay it forward. I think it's very important because once you've done things you wanted to do, happiness comes from helping others. I have, yes. a, I have a book, Sarah, that I'm going to send it to you that I, that I okay. wrote. I wrote as a class assignment when I was 10 years old and it's called The Flightless Mosquito. And it's a mosquito Ooh. that is obsessed with flying but has no wings. And when he Ooh. has the money, the resources, the skills to buy the wings, he prefers to help others with no wings so they can fly. Oh, that's perfect. Perfect. I think so, that I think that was one of the things about being coming a photo editor was how good it made me feel to help the other photographers with their work. Uh, it's like the best feeling, you know, you feel like you can help somebody. Yeah, it makes me it makes me happy too. So Sarah, thank you so much for, for being here, here, for taking the time. And uh, I, I have enjoyed quite a bit. I hope you, you have too. Thank you so much for having me and for anyone who was listening and sees this. Uh, this is a great podcast and uh, you should listen to some of the other ones. There's some really wonderful ones and wonderful people you've interviewed. And I really feel privileged and honored to be one of them. Thank you so much, Kike. Thank you, Sarah. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.